This is a reading from the notebooks by Maria Voltorda, 1945 to 1950, September and November of 1950, Chapter 2. The Apocalypse is a book of revelation, certainly. Indeed, it concludes the great revelation, but it is also a prophetic book. Both revelation and prophecy come from God, for only God inspires them. Only God can inspire them because he, only He knows the truth. In being the truth, and is familiar with future events because He is the Eternal, the All-Knowing, and the Almighty. Prophecy is like a projection of future events, seen by God alone, and illuminated for those living in the midst of their temporary present. To enable the great illiterates in religion to understand, and there are so many, even among those who limit being Catholics, to receiving the sacraments, obeying the precept to observe the days of obligation, taking part in processions, and going, yes, this too, to talks, but who are unable to respond when questioned on so many matters and the meaning of certain words. For one thing is the expression prophecy and prophets, and another apostle, and still, other, and still others, and they get something good involving light mixed up with what is not good, not made of light, because they do not know. To make these religious illiterates understand what religion is and what prophecy is, just as elsewhere to explain the unity and trinity of God, the comparison was used of the three sides of a polyhedron. In the same way, let the comparison now be used, and perhaps they will understand, of a projection based on real events, but happening in another place and in a previous time, or a projection of events which will certainly take, take place, but are not yet present and one single mind knows them, one single eye sees them, and one single word can set them forth. Man, over the ages, has made many inventions and discoveries, some good, some bad, and others which could have been good, because they could have been a means for training, instruction, and even elevation, and instead have become not good, because they have served to excite the base appetites of the inferior part, corrupt the intellect, and harm the soul as a result. One of these things, which could have been good, and which have not been good, have not become good in serving to disseminate vice, crime, and sin, is cinematography. Another is the press. But the former is of use to get our idea across. Cinematography, with its films, can depict events and persons of the past, more or less competently in historical terms, for man rarely does what he does well. Uh, man rarely does what he does well, and even more rarely does so according to the truth of things. But in any case, by means of this invention, it is possible to show the living persons, events, traditions, and customs of past centuries, and even millennia. The film flows by, and man sees. God takes a man, a prophet, or one inspired by him, certainly chosen by him for this purpose, and for his spiritual eyes and ears, depicts and relates past events whose truth has been altered because of the passage of centuries, or an involuntary alteration which may easily arise in oral revelation, or a voluntary alteration caused by religious schisms, heresies, or scientific investigations detached from religious wisdom. Or he illuminates and reveals future events which only he knows, in his eternal present, and they see and hear as if a film with sound were being projected in front of them, and God commissions them to manifest what he reveals to them, to become his hand and mouth, to write and say what God has been pleased to reveal. This comparison, Jesus too made use of comparisons to enable his followers to understand his lessons, will enable many to grasp what prophecy is and what the prophets are what the inspired person or seer is, and how one must believe in them, who manifest what is good, to know so as to proceed along sure paths, provided they do not say things incompatible with the faith and the great revelation. To some, prophecies seem to be something not only incomprehensible, because they are too obscure, but obsolete in speaking of events that took place centuries ago. Yes, many things mentioned in them have already happened, and will not be repeated, but many will be repeated, as they already have been every time humanity has returned to the condition for which the prophecy was given. 
Accordingly, whereas the incarnation of the Word and the foundation of the Church will not be repeated, since the Church, founded by Jesus, its pontiff and eternal head, cannot perish because of His divine promise, and there can thus be no need to found another, it is just as true that the punishments permitted by God as a result of the abomination entering the holy place and the human injustice will be repeated, as they already have been repeated, and in regard to many other things, it will be that way. Humanity, with alternate cycles of justice and injustice, of real faith and merely external faith, the letter and not the spirit of the faith, or even of non-faith, for half the world's population also undergoes alternate cycles of punishment and forgiveness, already suffered and obtained, respectively, without being made better by this, and prophecies because they are given by those seeing time with no limit in time, in many points serve as a light and guide, a voice of truth and a merciful counsel for every time. The Apocalypse, the prophecy of the Apostle of Light, and charity illuminates, and does so through charity, times, every time, until the last time. Nineteen centuries have passed since John received the revelation called the Apocalypse, whose time of fulfillment when measuring it solely against eternity could be termed near. But if the time of waiting, when measured against earthly time, was and is long as regards references to the state of the seven churches, it is as current now as it was then. John, on seeing the seven churches at that time, the seven more or less luminous lights at that time, saw not only those, but the other churches which would be formed over the centuries, just as he foresaw what, was ha what has happened and will happen on earth, in heaven and in the nether world, He saw the lights of holiness, the shadows of injustice, the growth of spirituality, the growth of humanity, or rather of materiality, the blazing of charity and of wisdom nourished by it, a blazing rising up to heaven, and the misty smoke of science devoid of wisdom crawling on the ground when man attempts to explain himself and so many other things in creation with his own knowledge alone. The sickening smoke of the lusts of the self, of all the lusts, the blameworthy smoke of selfishness and ferocity, smoke, smoke, nothing more than smoke, and harmful smoke, crawling on the ground, seeping in, sullying, poisoning, and killing, killing the best things in the sense which God gives to, his, to this word, and which we would call the most beautiful things, the three and four virtues, social relations, consciences, intellects, peace in the family, all of them things which the smoke, which is found where there is no blazing of charity, kills, poisons, sullies, and penetrates. The forming of the new world, the world of Jesus, of his kingdom, and the forming of a new world in the new one, the world of the Antichrist, of his kingdom. The triumphs of Christianity, the defeats of Christianity, the admirable unity of Christ's sheepfold, the rebellious separation of parts of the flock, John saw it all. And his vision was so intense that the fulfillment of all seemed to him to be immediate, but it was not. Centuries and centuries had to pass before everything viewed by the seer on Patmos was fulfilled, but everything will be fulfilled, as stated, as partially, and at different times it has already been fulfilled, though without reaching the completeness of the things which are not good foreseen by John. A human matter, which is not readily perfect, and even less readily not repeated, belonging to the people of God, did not keep the Jews from falling again into the same sins on different occasions. The example of Adam and the divine punishments with such means as the flood, the dispersion of peoples after the arrogance of Babel, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the oppression of Egypt did not keep the people from sinning. The mercy of God who freed them from the oppression of the Pharaoh and wanted to give them a select homeland and law did not lead men not to sin out of gratitude to God, and they sinned during the very journey towards the promised land, while God, as a true father, covered them with his gifts. Man is always man, in the old and new religion, both of them divine. Whether he belongs to the old or new church, you seek me not only because you have seen that I work miracles, but also because you ate those loaves of bread and were filled. 
John chapter 6, verse 26. Mankind is always like that. It is attracted by external, prodigious things, by what represents a novelty or even material enjoyment, by human hopes and promises which are thought to be attainable more than by internal, supernatural things which are no less certain. Indeed, much more prodigious, much more joyful, much more secure, and above all, much more enduring, for they are eternal. Judas is the perfect prototype of those who are seduced by material wonders and the hope of human honors, capable of satisfying intellectual and visual covetousness, a perfect prototype, not susceptible of conversion. The other apostles and disciples, though, were not free either from this human weakness, not complete in them, of which they stripped themselves more and more, to the point of being so detached from it that they could endure all that was humiliation and persecution, going so far as to be able to strip themselves of life itself to obtain eternal life. And when confirmed in faith, hope, and charity, in grace and wisdom and in piety, strength, and the holy fear of God, in all the gifts of the paraclete, they became as many other teachers and founders, not of a new doctrine and the new churches, for there is one perfect doctrine and church, but of the doctrine and the church, among new peoples and in new regions. Twenty centuries have passed. New apostles have succeeded the first apostles, and new churches, other churches, in ever new areas of the earth. Apostolic work knows no interruption or pause, even if, because of the faults of men, though proceeding, it recedes in the extent of its domain, and not only in this, the continuation of work, the propagation of the gospel, the expansion of the mystical body, undeniable truths and logical consequences since Christ nourishes his church, guides it, and spurs it on. And Jesus is eternal, powerful, and holy. His holiness descends and circulates in the whole body. His power provides mysterious strength to his servants. His eternity keeps the church from dying. But because of the sin and the ill will of men, while it has been proceeding and expanding for twenty centuries in new lands, it has been halting, retroceding, and indeed dying in others. A sin of these times alone? No, of all times, more or less totally and profoundly. While there were deviations, interruptions, separations, and even death in the shoots constituting the whole mystical vine, they were of different kinds, and the more the centuries passed, the more serious were the deviation and defection of the shoots of the vine. Now is the time of negation. But John saw all of these things. He foresaw them. He saw them in the seven churches at that time. He foresaw them in the churches now, of which the seven churches at that time were not only a truth, but a figure. And he also foresaw the present horror, that of negation, in too many places and in too many spirits, and he foresaw the final horror, the time of the Antichrist. He saw everything through the first vision. The final consequence is the result of the first consequence. Through cycles of ages it is repeated, growing more and more. The more the church grows, it is also painfully logical for this to occur. For the more Christ's affirmation and triumph grows in the saints, the more he is hated and opposed by the Antichrist. Is the mystical body winning its battles? The Antichrist increases his power and unleashes more atrocious ones. For if Christ wants to triumph, as is only right, the Antichrist also wants to triumph, and his violence grows. The more Christ triumphs to defeat and destroy him, oh, he cannot. Christ is the victor, but he hopes to and tries to. And since he cannot have a collective victory over the whole people of God, he seizes his individual or national victories, leading intellects astray, and possessing spirits, tearing peoples away from the church. The seven churches. They had been founded only shortly before, and founded by those who had been sent directly by God to found them. Go and teach all peoples. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. After, in keeping with the divine promise, they had received the Holy Spirit, who would remind them of everything and teach them all truth. John chapter 14, verse 26, in such a way as to be understood, that is, making them capable of understanding the highest things, so that robed in power from on high, 
Luke chapter 24, verse 49, they would, be ab- they would be capable of being the founders of such a lofty thing as the kingdom of God among men. And in spite of this, imperfection, and even more than imperfection, had formed in many of the churches, for the adversary or antichrist was already active spiritually and was already working to corrupt and destroy the spiritual fortresses of the kingdom of God to create discord among the members, to introduce subtle heresies, to arouse foolish pride, to counsel vile compromises between conscience and the law of the flesh, and mental restrictions which are hateful to God, whose language is yes to mean yes and no to mean no, and he wants the language of his children and faithful ones to be this way, to make charity grow cold, to increase love for earthly existence and wealth and material honors. This is the work of the adversary, tireless in working to try and defeat God and destroy what he has created, taking advantage of all that can help him, provided by men themselves because of their own imperfection or a reaction provoked by unjust actions by the strongest members towards the weakest ones. What it is right to say should be said, committing sins against justice and charity, which, like heavenly honey, draws souls to the mystical beehive and keep them faithful, provokes reactions by the stricken members, pain, scandal, and even distrust and separation. The church was founded by charity, and it should always have been perfect charity. The church is nourished by charity and should give perfect charity to all its members, also and above all to the least and the weak ones, to nourish them and keep them alive. The church received the command to teach charity, but woe if the teaching is limited to the letter, instead of being practiced in its spirit. To live in charity, to make the lambs live therein, this is the duty of the pastors. For if the lambs see that charity is expected by the pastors, and woe to the lamb who does not offer reverential love, spurred to the point of of renunciation, of free judgment, and free action in good things which God himself leaves man, indeed he leaves all freedom, limiting himself to seeing what is good and not good, while that charity is refused, the lambs by the pastors, what happens? Because of a heart that does not open itself to the limitless need of souls, I am speaking of the hearts of pastors, souls turn elsewhere and go knocking on other doors, and sometimes they are doors opening to material needs, and they give bread clothing, medicine, advice, and help to find a job, not to be thrown out of one's house by a hard-hearted rich man, but they also remove religion and justice from hearts. For this is what happens. And because of bread, clothing, a roof, or help to reestablish justice towards the persecuted, one soul or several souls leave the sheepfold, the pasture, the way of God, and go to other pastures, the former to material ways, the latter to anti-Christian ones. During this century's long development of the mystical vine, separations even of main shoots have taken place. There have been many causes, and not all of them derived from spontaneous rebellion by members, but also from rebellion provoked by rigorism without charity, which requires others to carry the weights one does not carry. For this reason, Israel experienced internecine battles and schisms. For this reason, the humble folk followed Christ. For this reason today, too, some members separate or at least remain bewildered or fall into scandal. Let us observe the seven churches at that time as John saw them and as he heard them being judged by the eternal judge. We shall see that what later and to, and to an ever vaster degree was and is active in the churches or religions called Christian, but which are not Catholic Christian, was already active in them the separated churches. They gave themselves a human constitution, preserving, as regards the true church, only what they liked to preserve to call themselves Christian. But to be Christians does not mean just to pray to Christ and preach Him in some, in some way or other. It does not mean to be even more rigorous than true Catholics in certain matters. To pray to God, to preach God, and to be rigid in the formalistic service of God, such was also done by the priests, scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' time among men, and yet that did not make them, aside from rare exceptions, Christians, 
but on the contrary, made them anti-Christians. To be Christians means to form part of the mystical body by belonging to the Church of Rome as Catholics and belonging to Christ by truly living as he taught and commanded us to live. Otherwise, one is not a Christian in reality, not even if one is Catholic, because one has received baptism according to the rite of the Church of Rome and the other sacraments, even if one has not fallen into and remained in serious sin, even if one has not gone so far as to deny the faith, form parts of sects condemned by the Church, or belongs to political rallies which are also condemned because they are rightly condemnable. One is not a true Catholic and real Christian when a Christian life is not led, when God is not honored with intense, continuous, inner worship, even in the intimacy of one's home, always present, even in the intellectual or manual work which one which must be carried out, and always active, even in the social relations which must be continuously maintained with all of our neighbors, whether more or less liked to us, whether more or less linked to us by bonds of blood or social relationships. One is not a true Catholic and real Christian when one practices only external, formal worship in order, be, in order to be praised, or only inner worship, so as not to be derided as sanctimonious, or perhaps suffer material loss. One is not a true Catholic and real Christian when one does not seek to practice virtues as perfectly as possible, to the point of heroism, if necessary, when one does not exercise what is called completion of the law, charity, of which the works of mercy are as many other branches, when one does not seek to suppress a vicious habit, which is the cause of sin, when one sins against the Holy Spirit by doubting divine mercy, which forgives those who repent, by presuming one can save oneself alone, by mocking or denying the luminous truths of the faith, not only the primary and principal truths, but everything contained in the creed and defined by the ancient and recent dogmas, by harboring envy towards the just, by obstinately remaining a sinner and impenitent, when one harms the life of one's neighbor or just the neighbor's physical health or honor, when one tramples on the order of nature by carrying out abominable acts which animals do not carry out, in blameworthy fashion, because they lack reason and conscience, by oppressing the poor, by practicing usury for illicit gain, and by limitlessly exploiting those who work and denying them a just wage. When one lives that way, Jesus' severe judgments of the scribes, Pharisees, and merchants in the temple are deserved. How appropriate it would be for the points in the gospel, which ought to be the book read every day by every Christian, sentence by sentence, meditating on the truths which yield life, where Jesus distinguishes between the truth of religious life and the appearance or falsification of religious life to be very frequently read, reread, and meditated on, and for one to examine oneself, compare oneself to the Pharisee and the publican, the Pharisees and the sinful woman, the Levite and the Good Samaritan, and the rich who tossed their excess wealth into the treasury, and the widow who tossed all she had to live on and see to which category one belongs, and repent and become a true disciple of the Master, a true child of God, and a true brother or sister of Christ. That is to be called a Christian, and even more, be one in reality, if one sees one belongs to the category with only external worship. For otherwise, people will be called Christians, but not be shoots nourished by him. They will be detached shoots, which, even if they are not completely dry, because a natural tendency towards goodness makes them act as just ones, are nevertheless branches that have, been, that have replanted themselves on their own in a proud way and have produced a plant standing apart, which yields fox grapes and not good ones. To go back to being such, they must enable again to be grafted onto the true vine, the only true vine enabling the shoots to bear abundant, holy fruit. This is valid for both the individual shoots and for those and for those forming a life apart, the separated churches, which, because they are separated and have given themselves their own constitution, conceived of by their founder, a man, and not the God-man, cannot have that totality of spiritual life which only belonging to the mystical body remains and which protects against even great, ever greater separations, not only from the body in itself, but from the truth and light which renders secure the way leading from the earthly church to the heavenly one. 
and the fact that not belonging to the mystical body produces a falling away from justice as well is seen more clearly than ever today. Separation is growing deeper. For some of the separated churches not only limit themselves to not offering veneration and obedience to the supreme pastor, not only do they take the liberty of raising their protests when the pontiff speaks with divine light, defining new truths, not only though saying they want to serve Christ, do they tear away from him, or try to, the creatures that belong to him, who are part of his sheepfold, and whom they, the separated ones, attempt to take to their own, to other pastures where not everything and especially the main part, is good. But, and this is monstrous, they set about celebrating the beast, the Antichrist, and approving his ideologies. But this too has been said, and the whole earth followed the beast in wonder. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Even though one sees that the beast, out of obedience to the dragon that gives it all power, is waging war on the saints and defeating them materially. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. War on the saints, that is, on all who worship the true God and remain faithful to Him, loving the Son of Man and of the woman with all their strength, and loving the woman who was God's tabernacle and sempiternal praise, the perfect image and likeness of God, not as we are since the tragic inheritance of Adam disfigured and weakened the divine likeness in us, not as Adam and Eve were before sin, two innocents, two children of God, with whom the Creator had conversations, whose true nature is a mystery, but which should not for this reason be placed in doubt. Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30, chapter 2, verse 16, chapter 3, 9, 11, 13, 16 to 19, and 21. Two persons predestined to live by and in the blessedness of the vision of God forever. No, Mary shaped by the divine hand to be the form of God incarnate, who was the most perfect image of the Father. Whoever sees me also sees my Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. Mary, with whom the triune God always had conversations, such as were proper to a true daughter, spouse, and mother. Mary, who with all her faculties was constantly attentive to her Lord, was and is the most pure mirror wherein the image of God appears, supreme beauty and perfection. And whoever contemplates Mary thus sees what constitutes the indescribable beauty, immersing the eternal citizens of heaven in the abysses of blessedness. Mary, the creature, our sister through human birth, Mary, the divinized creature, whose lesser spiritual sisters we can be, if only we want to, Mary, the masterpiece of God, the creator of men, Mary, the sign, measure, and perceptible form of what God has always destined for the human beings who live as children of God. Man, imperfect in believing in the resurrection of the flesh and in risen flesh's sharing in the joy of the blessed spirit, man, who because he is unable to believe in this truth, or at least is in doubt about it, who is not yet convinced by the resurrection of Christ because he says he was God and so, in the face of the established truth of the assumption of Mary in body and soul into heaven, can no longer doubt. His mind has a means which powerfully leads him to believe in the resurrection of the flesh and its sharing in the eternal joy of the Spirit. Jesus is the He who reveals the God the Father to us. Mary is she who reveals to us the blessed destiny of the children of God. Jesus is He who taught us as a master how to live as children of God. Mary is she who has shown us in practice how to live as children of God. And the men who find it difficult to follow the gospel and say he could even do so because he was God and some of his chosen ones can do so because the God, Jesus, gives them special gifts. On seeing the life, the way of life of Mary from the time she opened her eyes to the light, for in her, full of grace, there never was that state of nescience common to all the other newborn who are thus described as not responsible for their acts before the use of reason, can be convinced that living as children of God is possible for all those born of woman. Indeed, for all created by God, provided they want to live as divinized creatures. Nor should the following objection be made to this assertion. Mary was free from sin and its causes. Eve was too. Indeed, she was innocent in an innocent world, a queen, in the world subject to her, the only higher creature 
along with her man, endowed with intellect, grace, and knowledge, the mistress of the physical universe, guided by the voice of God. And yet she yielded to the first temptation, whereas numberless souls, though stained with sin, and many creatures, though having the causes in themselves, that terrible law of the flesh which made Paul, Augustine, and many others who are now men and women, saints in heaven, moan, did not yield. Mary, like Jesus, never sinned in any way, in any respect, not even with the logical, natural, proper reaction of a mother seeing her son being tortured and killed in regard to charity or any other virtue. She did not want to sin, and she did not. God certainly worked in a mysterious way in her, so that not even the slightest imperfection, I mean the shadow or seed of an imperfection, altered the purity and sanctity of the entirely beautiful woman. But it is also true that Mary seconded with all her faculties and will, the will which God had had for her. God did not make Mary a slave who can only obey the Master, commanding her, but a queen, his queen, to whom he sent an archangel as an ambassador to tell her about God's design, a design which is fulfilled only when Mary spontaneously says, Let it be done according to your word. The same archangel had manifested to the priest Zechariah, another prodigious prodigious cause of maternity, because it was outside of natural laws, given the age of the spouses and the sterility of the future mother. But, though a priest, and in the fullness of his priestly functions before the Holy of Holies, he doubted the power and mercy of God and the truth of the angel's words, and was punished for this.